Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 2023 Alice Tay Lecture on Law and Human Rights. I'm Dr. Melissa Lovell, Convener and Research Fellow of the Herbert and Valme Freilich Project for the Study of Bigotry at the ANU. Thank you for joining us. As always, I begin by acknowledging and paying my respects to the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people of the Canberra region, on whose traditional lands we gather this evening. I also pay my respects to any First Nations people who are with us for this event. This evening, we also acknowledge and remember the life and work of Professor Alice Tay, as well as a noted academic and president of the Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission, Professor Tay was a much admired member of the Freilich Project's board in the early years of this century. Next year, the philanthropically funded Freilich Project will celebrate 25 years of work supporting research on bigotry and the promotion of tolerance, or as we might put it these days, supporting inclusion and social cohesion. The Alice Tay Lecture in Law and Human Rights, first held in 2005, remains one of the highlight events of our annual calendar. It honours Professor Tay's life's work in human rights and the law. Each year, an invited lecturer contributes their unique expertise and strengths to a consideration of the role of human rights and the law in promoting a more socially just future. I'm very pleased to welcome Professor Renee Jeffrey as our lecturer this year. Renee Jeffrey is a Professor of International Relations at Griffith University, an Australian Research Council Future Fellow and a Fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia. Her research focuses on transitional and post-conflict justice in the Asia-Pacific and more recently on human rights in Australia's foreign affairs. Her 10th book, provisionally titled Unity and Prosperity, Human Rights in Australia's International Relations, is forthcoming. Renee will be talking to us for about 40 minutes and there'll be time for questions from the audience afterwards. I'd like to note that this lecture is being recorded but the question period will not be included in the published recording. Please join me in welcoming Professor Renee Jeffrey to present the 2023 Alice Tay Lecture in Law and Human Rights. Thank you. Um, thank you for that um, wonderful introduction and um, for the invitation to give this year's lecture, um, it's my honour and pleasure to be here. Um, I'd also like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners um, of the lands on which we're meeting and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. In the late afternoon of the 12th of March 2018, the United Nations Human Rights Council assembled in Geneva to address one of the most extensive and egregious human rights um, crises of our time, the systematic ethnic cleansing of Myanmar's Rohingya population. Australia was among the 47 member states present at the Human Rights Council that day. After a two-year campaign to win election to the Council, the month-long February to March session was the first of its coveted three-year term. Just er days earlier, UN Ass Assistant Secretary General for Human Rights, Andrew Gilmore, had returned from a four-day trip to Bangladesh, where he visited the sprawling refugee camp at Cox's Bazaar on the Bay of Bengal. There, an estimated 670,000 Rohingyas were sheltering in makeshift bamboo and tarpaulin tents after a violent crackdown by Myanmar's military. Meeting with camp residents, Gilmore heard harrowing accounts of the frenzied bloodletting and mass rape that provoked the initial flood of refugees in August 2017 and gathered evidence of the more recent low-intensity campaign of terror and forced starvation that had been implemented by the government in an effort to drive the remaining Rohingya from their homes. His assessment of the situation was unequivocal. The human rights abuses perpetrated against the Rohingya population in Myanmar amounted to nothing less than ethnic cleansing. In response, a chorus of condemnation emanated from the membership of the Human Rights Council. Norway and Germany raised concerns about the human rights situation. Denmark condemned it in the most uh, strongest possible terms. Canada reminded the Council that crimes against humanity could not go unpunished. France argued that crimes against humanity had been committed in Myanmar, while the United States called the ethnic cleansing of the Rohingya appalling. In stark contrast, Australia's response was not one of horror or condemnation. It did not denounce the violence suffered by Myanmar's Rohingya population as ethnic cleansing. It did not refer to the perpetration of human rights violations 
or call for prosecutions. Instead, it chose to declare itself a regional friend of Myanmar and cast systematic atrocities in bland and uncritical language as complex challenges. For this and its continuing ties to the Myanmar military at the time, Australia was roundly criticised. In a scathing report the following day, the Director of Legal Advocacy at the Human Rights Law Centre, Daniel Webb, accused Australia of losing its voice on the horrors unfolding in our region. Later in 2018, Mark Purcell, the CEO of ACFID, similarly argued that, I quote, as a member of the UN Human Rights Council, Australia has a responsibility to send a strong signal that it has a zero tolerance approach for gross human rights violations in our region including the abhorrent use of sexual violence as a weapon of war. Yet, as Webb had already made clear, rather than condemning human rights violations and supporting preventive and remedial action, time and time again, we see our government getting all mealy-mouthed about global humanitarian emergencies. In doing so, he suggested that Australia's response to the situation in Myanmar was not an anomaly but rather reflected a long-running pattern of engagement with the global human rights regime. So human rights um, occupy a curiously uncomfortable place in Australia's international relations. Like liberal democracies the world over, Australia's foreign policy is built on the principles of freedom, equality, respect for democratic values and the rule of law. As the former Attorney General George Brandis remarked at the launch of Australia's bid for its coveted seat on the Human Rights Council, commitment to human rights is essential to the very nature of what it means to be Australian. Human rights, he went on to say, are integral to what we as Australians regard as our sense of nationhood. We are, he concluded, a nation built on a belief in and a commitment to the human rights of all the human rights of all Australians and the human rights of all the peoples of the world. In one sense, this view has underpinned a foreign policy that is overtly committed to advancing human rights through multilateral institutions and bilateral dialogues, and which views human rights both as intrinsic goods and as a foundation on which peace and prosperity are built. Yet Australian foreign policy is also marked by a deep reluctance to impose values on others, to take consistent and decisive action against countries that systematically violate their population's human rights, or to speak up against some of the world's most egregious abuses. Preferring quiet diplomacy to overt criticism, Australia's self-avowed pragmatism has earned it a reputation for being soft on human rights, for letting economic interests override democratic principles, and for signalling tacit acceptance of repressive regimes that routinely violate human rights. It's also a foreign policy developed in a context in which Australia is itself facing significant criticism for its own human rights record. Australia's most recent Universal Periodic Review provided a decidedly mixed assessment of its human rights performance. On the positive side, the Human Rights Council Working Group welcomed progress made in the realisation of human rights in Australia since 2015. More critically, however, it also raised concerns over the mandatory detention of asylum seekers, the rights of children related um, to the age of criminal responsibility, and the rights of Indigenous people, in particular discrimination, inequality, and the high rate of incarceration among First Nations people. Despite its active commitment to monitoring other states' human rights practices through multilateral institutions, Australia has been extremely reluctant to implement recommendations made by those same institutions. Less than 10% of the recommendations made during the 2011 review process were implemented in the required time frame. In 2015, the United Nations Human Rights Committee castigated Australia for its chronic non-compliance with the committee's recommendations and criticised its habit of picking and choosing which, universal, so which international human rights laws and treaties to follow. The committee's vice chair, Yuval Shaney, remarked in this regard that Australia's behaviour was incredible for a country that claims to have a leading role in global human rights. <laughs> 
So what explains Australia's at times contradictory, often hypocritical and perennially uncomfortable engagement with the global human rights regime? In this lecture, I'm going to argue that much of Australia's discomfort stems from its reluctance to address its own human rights performance or to confront its own human rights history. From its exploitation of South Sea Islander labourers and efforts to curtail non-white immigration to its treatment of its First Nations people. To do so, I'm going to revisit the history of human rights in Australia's early international relations. And in doing so, show how the pursuit of national unity, which for much of the existence of this country um, has meant racial unity and prosperity have shaped and continue to shape its approach to human rights. To tell this story, I'm going to focus on the issue of indentured labour in the 19th century. Although there are several other issues I could choose, the issue of South Sea Islander labour goes to the heart of Australia's approach to human rights and shows how the overriding dominance of national unity and prosperity led to the subordination of human rights in Australia's international affairs. Yet I want to make it very clear that this is not simply an issue of historical interest. It's also one of contemporary importance that Australia fails to address in its contemporary international relations. Deeply embedded in Australia's engagement with human rights, baked in, if you like, over 200 years, unity and prosperity continue to mark its foreign policy. The 2017 Foreign Policy White Paper references prosperity a staggering 87 times. It tells us that human rights are to be valued because they underpin peace and prosperity. It tells us that human rights, uh, while the paper professes Australia's commitment to advancing human rights globally, the value proposition it poses is in terms of stability, security and, once again, prosperity. And while the term unity has been replaced by the idea of social cohesion and coupled with multiculturalism, its close relationship to um, prosperity remains unchanged. The white paper tells us that by generating more and better paying jobs, a strong and flexible economy reinforces the social cohesion and resilience of Australian society. It also continues to inform Australia's approach to issues of migration and criticisms of its treatment of asylum seekers. Without a well-managed migration program, the white paper tells us, the cohesion of our society would be damaged and community support for our humanitarian program would be unsustainable. This argument was replicated in Australia's 20, uh, response to the 2020 Universal Periodic Review and used to reject calls to bring its asylum seeker policies in line with its obligations under the Refugee Convention. In short, Australia's pursuit of unity and prosperity and willingness to subordinate human rights to achieve those ends raises serious questions about who we are and what we value. So, although they often considered an invention of the 1940s, by the time the international community gathered um, in the aftermath of World War II um, to draft the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, human rights had been a topic of discussion and debate um, around the world and including in Australia and its colonies for more than a century. As early as the 1830s, the term human rights was appearing in the Australian newspapers, casting the practice of slavery as a violation of the most sacred and indefeasible human rights and as an outrageous violation of human rights. Others writing in the 1830s drew on the idea of human rights to highlight injustices perpetrated against the colony's indigenous populations. They not only emphasised the idea that all human beings are entitled to the full rights and privileges of humanity, but equated human rights with the avoidance and prevention of cruelty. In 1842, in the midst of public debate over the introduction of representative democracy in New South Wales, the short-lived newspaper, the Sydney Free Press, ran a series of articles defending universal suffrage and liberty as indefeasible rights. In direct terms, one author wrote, human rights are not to be so reasoned away. They belong to man as a moral being and nothing can divest him of them but the destruction of his nature. 
By 1859, the Sydney Morning Herald had published an article declaring that the recognition of human rights is a grand event for mankind. That idea of human rights, it continued, has no geographical boundaries, but rather gives to the whole human race a more distinct sympathy with each member. For the most part, these understandings of human rights were direct references to appropriations and adaptations of notions of human rights that were developed in the context of the anti-slavery movement. The rise of the anti-slavery movement in the 18th century, which culminated in the popular acceptance of abolition in the century that followed, marks the most radical turning point in the practice of human rights. In the space of a few short decades, the efforts of anti-slavery campaigners brought about a dramatic shift in the perceived morality of treating some human beings as property to be bought and sold and forced to engage in unrecompensed labour. By the time it reached its height in the middle of the 18th century, the transatlantic slave trade had seen almost 9 million individuals trafficked from Africa to Europe, the Americas and the Caribbean. By the middle of the 18th century, it had been outlawed first by Britain, then by Denmark, France and the Netherlands. Now, while that shift did not bring about the absolute abolition of slavery, a practice that continues to evade eradication today, it signalled a new era in thinking about the rights of individuals. Grounded in principles of natural rights, the anti-slavery movement extended the idea that human life is equally deserving of respect to the enslaved, and in doing so became, as Ari Nea argues, the parent of all subsequent efforts to defend rights on the basis of respect for individual human dignity and autonomy. The first 50 years of Australia's colonial history coincided with the rise and eventual success of the anti-slavery movement. The second found the colonies facing intense scrutiny, censure and accusations of slavery for their proposed labour trade with India and their labour recruitment practices in the Pacific. It was in debates over the ethics, social costs and economic merits of importing foreign labour, legislative efforts to stamp out the practice of kidnapping South Sea Islanders known as blackbirding, and several landmark court cases in the, in the 1870s and 80s that the foundations of Australia's approach to human rights in its foreign affairs were laid. It was also in each of these contexts that the colony's competing priorities values and prejudices were laid bare. Among the key challenges that were faced by the Australian colonies in the early decades of the 19th century was, of course, the need to secure an adequate supply of labour. From the very start, human rights in the colonies' international affairs were related in a direct and intimate way to the violations perpetrated against its indigenous populations. As Tracy Banavanawa Ma tells us, with the appropriation of large tracts of land from their traditional owners and the transformation of those lands into large-scale pastoral and agricultural operations came the growing demand for labour in the form of farmhands and shepherds. The solution to this problem, proposed by a number of prominent businessmen, was the importation of indentured labourers. Among them was John Mackay, who arrived in Sydney with his family and five Bengali servants in August 1836. For the previous 28 years, Mackay um, had operated as a merchant and indigo planter in Bengal, employing large numbers of Indian workers. Mackay argued that Bengali hill coolies, as they were known, were not only suitable for the conditions in the colony, but were quiet, docile and industrious, and could be maintained at a very low cost. To illustrate his point, Mackay drew on the example of Mauritius, where after the abolition of slavery, large numbers of Indians sought work on the sugar plantations. Arriving from Mauritius in May 1837, J.R. Mayo brought first-hand experience of its labour system and with it plans to grow cotton in the colony and lent his support to Mackay's plan. Almost immediately, tensions between the dual demands for unity understood in racial terms, and prosperity came to the fore. Despite some support for Mackay's plan, critics of the proposal, including the prominent minister, politician and activist John Dunmore Lang, 
opposed the importation of Indian labourers on racial grounds, raising concerns about, I quote, the absolute intolerable prospect of intermarriage propagating mongrel and degenerate progeny. As Lang wrote in his newspaper, The Colonist, we feel a repugnance, at once natural and just, to any extensive fraternisation with a race so essentially different from ourselves, and acknowledge that although the colony was suffering from a lack of labour, Englishmen would on all hands be preferred to take on the work. Others turned to anti-slavery rhetoric to oppose the idea of importing Indian indentured labourers. By 1839, the trafficking of Indian workers to work on the sugar colonies was being referred to as the East Indian slave trade, and by extension cast a significant pall on, Australian, on the Australian colony's plans to follow suit. In the British House of Commons, the radical politician William Molesworth argued that indentured labour was a new kind of slavery and a new kind of slave trade, designed by planters to ensure a ready supply of labouring hands and fully sanctioned by government, adding that his particular concern was for the hill coolies that Mackay and Mayo proposed importing into New South Wales. By the time the New South Wales Legislative Council had determined not to support Mackay's plan, however, he had already brought 13 indentured Indian labourers to, the, to the colony to work as shepherds. His scheme was an unmitigated disaster. Not only did the workers flee, but once located, they took Mackay to court, claiming breach of contract on account of insufficient provision of food and clothing, although they eventually uh, lost their case. Although Mayo and Mackay's proposal had provoked some opposition to the idea of importing foreign indentured labour, it was really with the arrival of workers from the Pacific that comparisons to slavery and engagement with the ideas of human rights really began to gather pace. In 1847, Benjamin Boyd brought the first indentured labourers from the Pacific to New South Wales. Like Mackay's experiment before him, Boyd's initial attempt to source cheap labour was not a success. Most of the 70 men um, and boys imported from the New Hebrides and the Loyalty Islands died, fell ill or ran away. As Anne Kerthoys and Jesse Mitchell note, to Boyd's surprise, his actions were met with near universal opposition. So reprehensible were his operations that he was not simply cast as a pariah among urban liberals, but deemed an embarrassment by his friends and associates. In short, the practice of importing indentured labourers from the Pacific Islands was from the very start denounced as a form of slavery. As its detractors argued, Boyd's labour recruitment practices contravened the basic principles of human rights, and in particular the right to liberty, as well as the exercise of free will, freedom from harm, and though not technically a right, the expectation of benevolence. Despite these misgivings, however, the problem of labour supply did not abate. When the government of Queensland first sat in May 1860, it faced two immediate problems. A critical lack of labour and a pressing need to expand the economy beyond its reliance on the pastoral industry. The solution to the second of these problems favoured by many was the development of a cotton industry. As Thomas Douse proclaimed in a letter to the Morton Bay Courier in 1861, grow cotton and we will introduce capital. Although he didn't wish to be drawn on the issue of indentured labour, Douse acknowledged that cotton and sugar, the other commodity that seemed like a viable commercial enterprise for Queensland, would, I quote, never be grown here to any extent without cheaper labour than European. Others, however, vehemently opposed the idea of importing indentured labourers and, like their New South Wales counterparts, likened the practice to slavery. Some, including John Dunmore Lang, went so far as to say that the establishment of a large-scale cotton industry based on free labour in Queensland could help overturn American slavery and help expunge some of Britain's guilt over its slave trading past. For the most part, however, their arguments were not altruistic or motivated by a desire to defend the rights of would-be indentured workers. Rather, they reflected a strong preference for the labour requirements of the colony to be met by free British and European migrants. Such was the pull of prosperity, however, that the demand for labour remained strong 
outweighing both moral and racial concerns, as well as concerns that the importation of foreign labour would undercut local wages. In 1863, Robert Townes bought the first shipment of 67 South Sea Islanders to Queensland to work on his cotton plantation, established on land taken from its traditional owners along the banks of the Logan River south of Brisbane. Within days of their arrival, Towns and his labour recruiter, Ross Lewin, were embroiled in controversy. The North Australian forthrightly declared that the slave trade had commenced in Queensland before likening Towns to Benjamin Boyd. Yet with the rapid expansion of the sugar industry in northern New South Wales and Queensland, the demand for cheap labour only grew with more and more plantation owners recruiting from the Pacific. Lasting for more than four decades, the trade would see around 62,500 South Sea Islanders brought to Queensland to work, primarily on the sugar and cotton industries. Most came from the Loyalty Islands, the New Hebrides, and later the Solomon Islands. While some came willingly, signing multiple contracts, travelling back and forth between Queensland and their island homes, and recommending particular employers to their family and friends, others were deceived, coerced, kidnapped and sold. Although they and their descendants prefer to be known as South Sea Islanders, at the time they were most commonly referred to as Kanakas, the Hawaiian word for man. What is more, although most were Melanesians, throughout the 19th century they were incorrectly identified or referred to as Polynesians. So throughout this period, opponents of South Sea Island labour recruitment insisted that the practice was a form of slavery. In Brisbane, anti-slavery efforts were led by a small abolitionist society established by Robert Short. As a former resident of the West Indies, Short had first-hand experience of the evils wrought by slavery, both on the enslaved and on the social and political development of slave-holding societies. By 1867, he'd made a name for himself as a vocal opponent of South Sea Islander labour recruitment, publishing regular letters in the Brisbane Courier and delivering public lectures at the Brisbane School of the Arts. The general crux of his argument was always the same. The South Sea Islander labour trade was nothing more nor less than incipient slavery in disguise. This was not a novel characterisation, but drew directly on terms used by anti-slavery activists in Britain and North America to describe French efforts to encourage free migra migration from Africa and India to work on its uh, plantations in Guadeloupe, Martinique and Cayenne. In one of his letters, Short included a lengthy extract of an article by the English sociologist and feminist anti-slavery activist Harriet Martineau, published in the Edinburgh Review, which had described um, immigration from Liberia to the French colonies and American plantations as a disguised labour trade and caused an enormous fuss, um, including threats of legal action from the president of Liberia. Almost a decade later, Short drew on the article's um, contents to explicitly compare South Sea Islander labour trade to the Liberian trade and to argue that the policy of importing free labourers that had been denounced throughout the civilised world as a revival of the slave trade had been resuscitated in Queensland. Short was assisted in his campaign by William Brooks, member for North Brisbane between 1864 and 1867. Described as a rabid abolitionist, Brooks also promulgated his argument on the pages of the Brisbane Courier. His arguments were not exclusively altruistic or based on appeals to human rights, but were also driven by his long-standing belief that coloured labour means ruin, ruin in body and soul as a British colony, ruin to our trade. It means the entire, an entire suppression of all our morals, our religion, our civil and constitutional liberties. That is, like many earlier opponents of Indian labour, Brooks fundamentally believed in the superiority of white workers. Nonetheless, by the late 1860s, Short and Brooks had taken their campaign to London, corresponding on a semi-regular basis with members of the British and Foreign Anti-Slavery Society. In the years that followed, its journal, The Anti-Slavery Reporter, described the Queensland labour trade as a clandestine slave trade, worse than real slavery, slavery in disguise, or simply as kidnapping. 
At around the same time, the London Quaker Journal, The Friend, published an article written by Brooks um, <clears throat> that included eyewitness testimony of kidnapping and other atrocities committed by the crew of the Siren during a recruitment voyage in the New Hebrides. Republished in almost all the major newspapers throughout the Australian colonies, the account sparked significant debate about the legitimacy of Queensland's approach to the problem of labour shortages. In response to the negative slavery, uh, the negative publicity brought by the Siren case, um, and with the governor of um, New Caledonia and the French government having lodged several complaints about Queensland vessels frequently kidnapping in French waters, the Queensland government passed the Polynesian Labourers Act of 1868. Seeking to balance the competing demands of supporters and critics of the Pacific Island labour trade, it acknowledged that while, I quote, many persons have deemed it desirable and necessary in order to enable them to carry on their operations in tropical and semi-tropical agriculture, the prevention of abuses against labourers was also a necessity. The Act introduced a range of me measures to protect labourers, including a requirement intended to prevent kidnapping that a consul, missionary or other person responsible sign a statement that recruits had been legitimately enlisted. With no consuls posted either to the New Hebrides or to the Solomon Islands, that task largely fell to the missionary community, which for the most part, with a few small exceptions, opposed the act, believing that it effectively sanctioned a trade in slaves. More significant then was a series of slavery cases tried in the courts of New South Wales and Queensland in the 1870s and 80s. The most important of these was the case of the Jason, heard at the Supreme Court of Queensland in 1871. It was here that the most significant responses to the practice of blackbirding were first articulated in terms of universal rights. The case involved the alleged kidnapping of nine South Sea Islanders to be sold into servitude by the ship's captain, John Coth. The prosecution argument rested on the idea that kidnapping was a violation of the universally held right to liberty. Chief Justice John Cockle, so Chief Justice Cockle and Justice Lutwich both agreed. In his judgment, Cockle equated the labour trade with slavery and warned that if once among these nations an opinion should get abroad that our law proceeded upon principles so inhuman that their rights could be violated with impunity by any man who may choose to outrage them. I say that the safety of commerce itself and the blessings it maintains would be endangered. That is, to a legal argument about rights, an appeal to the continued prosperity of the colony was added. Yet it was Justice Lutwich's judgment that for the first time cemented the place of liberty in Australia's understanding of the principles on which its engagements with foreign peoples ought to be conducted. Whether they are civilised or not matters not. They have a right to liberty, which is inherent in all human beings, said Lutwich. As Mortensen notes, this was a singular precedent that would later form part of Justice Lilly's judgment in the 1884 case of the hopeful. That case saw the recruiting agent, Neil McNeil, and boatswain Barney Williams tried for the murder of a man named Tenepapa at Harris Island, now part of Papua New Guinea, and the kidnapping of eight others. Drawing on Lutwich's argument about universal human rights in his instructions to the jury, Judge Lilly implored the jurors to put aside the widely held belief that the life of a black man was of little importance. Both were found guilty and sentenced to be hanged. Three days later, five others implicated in the atrocities were tried, found guilty and sentenced to hard labour, the first three years to be spent in irons. After significant public backlash, all the sentences were actually commuted. But the point had been made. Fundamental human rights were universally held. They applied not just to the white settler community of the colonies, but to those with whom they engaged from other parts of the world. While the persistent efforts of humanitarians led to increased regulation, the end of the Pacific Island labour trade came not as a result of humanitarian concern or the adoption of universal principles of human rights in Australia, but as a result of the white Australia policy, 
operationalised in the Immigration uh, Restriction Act of 1901 and the Pacific Island Labourers Act. In Alfred Deakin's view, these two policies, the first of which sought to restrict non-European immigration to Australia, and the second of which was designed to end the use of Pacific Islander labourer before deporting remaining South Sea Islanders, were necessary complements of a single policy, the policy of securing a white Australia. Of course, arguments suggesting that national unity of the newly established Federal Commonwealth of Australia could only be achieved through the imposition of racial unity served as a direct challenge to establish principles of liberty and universal human rights. As Marilyn Lake and Henry Reynolds explain, they suggested that although individual liberty and other rights were theoretically universal on account of common humanity of all human beings, the exercise of those rights was the exclusive preserve of the white settler population. Australia's first Prime Minister, Edmund Barton, put the position plainly in his contribution to debate on the Immigration Restriction Bill when he stated, I do not think that the doctrine of equality of man was really ever intended to include racial equality. There is no racial equality. There is basic inequality. These races are, in comparison to white races, unequal and inferior. In bringing an end to Pacific Island labour migration, issues of race trumped arguments about the economic benefits of indentured labour for the Queensland sugar industry. Among those who opposed the Pacific Islanders Pacific Island Labourers Act were planters supported by the Queensland Premier Robert Philp, who feared the policy would entirely destroy the Queensland sugar industry. In a letter to the Senate in November 1901, Philp drew on notions of racial equality in an attempt to have the bill um, set aside by the Governor General. The Pacific Islanders were, Philp argued, legal immigrants, many of whom who had been in Queensland for long periods of time. The plan to deport them, he continued, would cause great inhumanity and injustice. Also opposing the legislation were members of the Pacific Islander community in Queensland who unsuccessfully petitioned King Edward VII to overturn the deportation provisions of the Act, which they argued contravened their rights to freedom, justice and mercy. One prominent uh, um, article published in the Queenslander in 1902 presented the issue as an explicit matter of human rights. We should know, it argued, that beyond all Commonwealth law, there lies the bar of human rights. That bar precluded measures that put its, put its subjects at risk of death, absolute exile or other harms. Also drawing on notions of liberty, free will and moral sentiment, the article argued that the issue was not simply that deportation by force was utterly against their will, but that it would require their reasons for wanting to stay, reasons with which every just and in, sorry, with which every just and humane person must sympathise to be overridden and ignored. The issue it concluded was one based on a common human right that the Kanaka is entitled to remain in Queensland if he prefers to do so, and that would, it would be a great and cruel wrong to force him back to his islands. In the end, however, appeals, um, arguments about national unity trumped appeals both to human rights and economic prosperity. And the South Sea Islander community was subjected to what Clive Moore has described as one of the cruelest pieces of legislation we have ever had. Between late 1906 and 1908, more than 7,500 South Sea Islanders were deported from Australia with devastating results, both for those who were expelled and those who remained. Many of those sent home had left um, with their parents as small children or for various reasons no longer had strong familial or cultural connections to their islands of um, origin and found their readjustment incredibly difficult. Families were torn apart with some members being granted one of 1,654 official exemptions which permitted them to stay in Australia while others were forced to leave. Those who remained faced discrimination the imposition of further legislation restricting their ability to work and limited access to education and health services. The ramifications of that discrimination um, and disadvantage continue to be felt today. Beyond its impact on the descendants of the South Sea Islander indentured labourers, 
Australia's historical labour recruitment processes and immigration policies continue to have ramifications with its relations with the contemporary nations of the South Pacific. In 2013, events marking the 150th anniversary of blackbirding in Port Vila sent an unequivocal message to the Australian government. At the centre of the comm commemorations was a reenactment that depicted people in chains, stolen away and then callously returned, dumped off ships on strange islands, as Clive Moore described it. Leading the crowd in a chorus of shame on you, the Prime Minister condemned Australia both for its historical role in blackbirding and for its contemporary failure to address this legacy. The following month, a reenactment took place at Ormiston House in Queensland to mark the 150th anniversary of the arrival of Robert Towne's recruitment ship, the Don Juan. Echoing earlier pleas for an official apology, participants also called for restitution for the estimated 38 to $40 million in wages that was never forwarded to the families of deceased South Sea Islander workers. Focusing on the figure of Robert Towns, the 150th anniversary commemorations also reignited debate over the bronze statue of Towns on the banks of Ross Creek in Townsville. Unveiled in 2005, the statue has been condemned by members of the South Sea Islander community as part of an effort to whitewash Australia's history of slavery. While alluding to Towns' reputation as a blackbirder, the interpretive signage near the statue dismisses this as an unfound allegation, describing his attitude to islanders as paternalistic but well-intentioned. In June 2020, as the New South Wales Environment Minister began considering calls to rename Ben Boyd National Park, Peter John Wright painted the hands of the town's statue red and wrote slave trader on the accompanying park, plaque. After receiving a fine for causing willful damage, Wright called the statue a stain on the moral conscience of this town. Well, that stain and statue remain. In November 2021, it was announced that Ben Boyd National Park would be renamed. It's now known as Bayoa National Park. Whether this marks the beginning of a more widespread reckoning with Australia's past remains to be seen. Yet without that reckoning, Australia's engagement with human rights, both in its domestic politics and its international relations, will, I think, continue to be uncomfortable and, in my view, highly unsatisfactory. Thank you.